Um, hi, Summit. Uh, thank you so much hi. for helping with my project. Uh, could you say a little bit about yourself? Uh, okay, so my name is Sumit, uh, Sumit Bhatta, uh, to, be, to say my full name. And I'm a third year aerospace student uh, studying here in Nepal. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you. And, uh, uh, yeah. I guess, uh, how did you get into aerospace? So I was always fascinated with space and stuff and the origin creation of the universe and everything. And uh, on my engineering degree, I decided uh, it, had just, it had just started in a year in Nepal when I uh, started college. So um, I decided to apply for aerospace and got into it. And I'm currently studying in third year, third year. Uh, and what kind of opportunities are there in aerospace in Nepal? So uh, right now, regarding space, there are, aren't much opportunities here in Nepal, but uh, regarding aviations and uh, uh, airplanes, a lot, uh, two or three airports are being built, international ones. And so those opportunities are on the horizon, but regarding space, we are pretty new to it. Uh, do you uh, plan to develop a company or something in Nepal, or do you plan to move to another country uh, uh, to explore your interests? Yeah, I eventually a company would be desirable, uh, actually. But uh, to further studies, I plan to go abroad uh, because there aren't much universities. Uh, actually, there aren't any universities uh, uh, providing master's exam, master's studies here in Nepal. So. That being said, yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, do you have some uh, universities already in mind? Uh, not quite. Uh, I don't have any in particular, but uh, TU Delft and uh, Purdue University sound like a sound choice in those sectors. That, that sounds neat. And were there other things that you were interested in as well? Uh, or was it always aerospace so you knew exactly what you wanted to do? Uh, not actually, but uh, I'm quite into sort of, uh, writing also. I mean, literature, story writing and non-fictional uh, stuff as well. But aerospace, uh, I was more propelled towards it, let's say that. Um, what kind of uh, fiction writing do you do? Uh, I'm not that pro into it, but uh, some sort of story writings and uh, uh, some spacey with some spacey vibes, let's say, a mixture of airspace and fiction, sort of like that. Uh, can I ask one question though? Absolutely. Yeah, can I know more about yourself, Nathan? Uh, well, I live in, live in Houston, Texas. I work oh. for a software company, uh, but uh, space is a, a passion of mine. So I started uh, a local chapter of the National Space Society called the North Houston Space Society. I also uh, started this project. Uh, yesterday, I did my 600th interview. Today is my oh, wow. 601. Uh, I'm almost a, a third of the way through the project. I only have 1,239 more to do. <laughs> wow, that's a lot, man. You've been doing this continuously every day? Every day since December of 2019. Wow, that's astonishing, mind blowing. I mean, the perseverance you have to do that, man. Absolutely, it's uh, it's been quite the the effort. <laughs> and what kind of experiences are you getting with these interviews? Well, um, I I mean the online interviews. I get to talk to people in Nepal, in Egypt, in Pakistan, in India, in uh, Peru, in Chile, uh, all over the world. So I get a really international perspective through the online interviews. Uh, yeah. And it's just, um, I mean, one thing is, uh, I think uh, uh, most people don't know where uh, NASA is planning to go back to the moon in 2024, probably because yeah. uh, they're really concerned about other things at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, a thing that always comes up is, why do you go to space? You know, we should rather build Earth. That always comes up in an argument, you know, and I tried to tell them that since space uh, technology, since space is an epitome of technology, we must always try to move forward towards it. Yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, it's a big uh, trade-off choice. I think the one question um, that is key is what's the future of humanity? Is it 
are we are going to be forever earth centric and our entire existence will forever be on the earth and will never go any place so that's option one option two is uh, we do actually figure out how to live on other worlds and travel there and humanity eventually branches out uh you know throughout the entire solar system and yeah for for people who believe in option one it's really hard to justify uh human space exploration yeah it's hard to but you know some good arguments and they'll also catch up do sound so much fascinating for us though it is but uh whenever you talk to people uh, what are some of the yeah so you, what are some of the things that they think should be done on earth that they believe isn't being done so you know since uh, since i'm from a developing nation and we're new to space and when uh, we ask for government funds or uh, sponsorship uh, deals from people always this kind of argument comes up like why aren't why aren't young minds like yours unlike mine are focusing on poverty reduction or you know other uh, stuff that could help the country by itself rather than the space they always come come up with such questions and it's hard to deal day on on and on with them you know i often wonder um what their minds are focused on the people asking these questions <laughs> yeah they're they're <laughs> they're usually unemployed <laughs> Oh, unemployed is that yeah um, well i mean the the thing is um you know that means they have a lot of uh, free time uh, to to go and take care of these problems yeah absolutely but you no know, can just change people like that that's uh that's the part that i always kind of struggle with is it feels like if the people who are trying to convince people what to do actually spend their time and energy doing the thing that they're trying to convince them to do it would be taken care of exactly that i think that every single day i mean yeah just and um, uh, yeah go on go on yeah and i i mean i just feel like we uh, kind of uh, limit ourselves you know i mean or like um you know we go oh i'm i'm poor there's nothing i can do to help uh the world i need to convince uh jeff bezos or or you know some some rich person to go do something but you know we're we're really powerful people you know i mean i uh, sure we can't write a check for a million bucks or 100 million dollars but uh we can go and uh clean up a street or um you know deliver a meal to uh somebody that's hungry uh you know these are these are powerful acts and absolutely man we we over just the uh, the ability of our own minds i mean really excited but uh did you know that nasa was planning to send people back to the moon in 2024 i did actually so there was a guy from our own country that uh gave us a presentation a few years back on the artemis mission uh mission and uh i got to know there first about 2024 artemis mission and i was actually pretty glad to see human step back in the moon 52 years in 52 years time i mean i was i'm shocked actually to see that 52 50 years have passed and no people has no no person has stepped on the moon in that time period they did in 672 and not anymore i would it surprise you that most of the people i talked to don't know that we're going back to the moon in 2024 i'd say that they they aren't involved in the space field and i don't think i think i didn't think we haven't been able to reach this the artemis mission artemis mission hasn't been able to reach them uh more yeah in a better way i'd say hmm. uh let me ask you one question what sure. kinds of are people into the the kind you interviewed before me uh well i mean it's hard to generalize everybody's doing different things i've talked to a voice actor who uh you know does like recordings for yeah, movies yeah. i've talked to uh 
you know, lawyers, I've talked to uh, students, I've talked to uh, people in like accounting and finance. So um, everybody's into all sorts of different things. No, uh, it's, it's good, you know. The more pe people know about space and this, these kind of missions, the greater it'll be, I guess, for us all. Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of, you know, back in uh, 1969, whenever Neil and Buzz first landed on the moon, uh, every, I think that was like the, the, you know, it was on all the TV stations, it was on the, the, the newspapers, the magazines, the radio. Uh, and I, I think it was really something that brought a lot of people together. But, um, you know, that us going back to the moon may be something that very few people actually know about just because of the way that uh, we communicate information as a society. Yeah, I think, and I think when we're talking about, when we are already sending rovers to Mars and talking about taking the next step, Mars and beyond, I think moon doesn't fascinate that much to people now. You know, yeah, and you know, people uh, often also say, you know, we've been there. Why are we going back? Um, yeah. You know, but we haven't really explored the moon. I mean, there's so much more to learn, um, and we also haven't developed the moon. We've not extracted any resources. We've done no manufacturing on the moon. We we don't have any uh, facilities to live on the moon. Uh, so I, I mean, there's like so much we haven't done. Yeah, when whenever I get asked, you know, why we're going to moon again, I'd say that this is an incubation phase for going to Mars. In the next being the next step, you know, I see it then that way. And uh, also, um, you know, potentially the development on the moon could be so big, you could see evidence of them from Earth, you know. And I yeah. think whenever people are able to look up at the sky and see the moon and see people there, that will have a big mind shift for people. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so where do you see humanity 500 years from now? 500 years from now? I mean, the way the technology has been expanding, I mean, logarithmically, exponentially, I mean, that way I can see us moving to maybe i can see us going out of the solar system if i may <laughs> put that in there but we will need to develop something that's gonna uh, provide us an alternative as for the propulsion system we have right now that we will need it and also five to travel beyond the solar system we're gonna need you know wait our own life in the uh, space spacecraft because uh, that is going to be a long long time and one life cycle isn't going to be enough to go beyond the solar system i guess and yeah there could be many challenges but i am hopeful you know to go beyond the solar system in 500 years of time yeah that that would be an interesting voyage you know i mean to think i mean assuming we don't develop figure out anything new with physics and, you know, or some unique structure of the, the, the universe where uh, you kind of like have hidden tunnels between places. Assuming that doesn't happen, uh, you know, it's going to be a long voyage. I mean, you're essentially, yeah. uh, your entire world is whoever is on that ship. Actually, even, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, to think that our upcoming generations, uh, regardless of 10th or 15th, could go on that voyage seems surreal right now, you know, even thinking about it. And so I kind of talking about what uh, will happen in 500 years is a very broad thing, but I have a series of questions I've been working on uh, to kind sure. of help, um, you know, narrow the thinking a little bit. Uh, and the, the answers to the questions uh, could be either more or less. So first question yeah. is in 500 years, do you think we'll have more countries than we do now or less countries than we do now? Less. I go for less. You know, I'm kind of a global, globally, I think we should be one globally. I think countries just are random segregation of uh, landmarks and we shouldn't have like, you know, boundaries and stuff to the humanity should be uh, able to, to get closer more. We should be able to do that. And countries, I think, shall die down eventually. 
And how about people? Uh, 500 years from now, will we have more people than we do now or less people than we do now? I mean, that is, uh, do we, I mean, you can see, uh, to choose one, um, I'd say less. I'd say less. I'd opt for less, you know. Um, many calamities, I think, are incoming that we haven't seen yet. Science can create such explosions, and many people are likely to suffer. But more than that, I think uh, the population growth cell itself reduced down since uh, the natural resources are, you know, uh, depleting severely. So I guess the population will come to a stop at a certain number and then eventually get less and less. Now, about the natural resources depleting, uh, which ones are you most concerned about? Uh, Actually, I'm about water. Uh, unless we develop, a, you know, really, but I think we will develop uh, uh, about drinking water. Uh, uh, water resource can be a problem in the future, I think. Uh, yeah, water resources. Well, and you know, the thing about water is uh, you just have to clean it. Like it's, it's not it's not water that's in scarce demand, it's, it's clean water that's in scarce demand. Yeah, yeah. Or scarce. Yeah, and uh, you know uh, the talks of desalination and such coming along. I'm hopeful for the future, but right now, looking at the condition, uh, I think this should be uh, focused upon right now, uh, so that it won't be the problem in the future. You know. Absolutely, and you know, whenever we look at the astronauts on the International Space Station, uh, you know, yeah. they recycle their their water and every water. Uh, yeah, every. And uh, so, you know, you, maybe you, we figure out some way to economize that technology and, um, you know, people are able to recycle their water. Um, uh, how about languages? Um, more languages than we have now or less languages? Uh, less, I'd say less. You know, there are many languages in my country itself and uh, about 44 languages we have uh, within our country itself. And uh, most of them are dying down. Uh, uh, and uh, there are only a few languages that have only like 20, 30 native speakers right now. And I can see wow. them dying. Only yeah. 20 or 30 language, uh, native speakers. Yeah. And I can see them dying down in the in, uh, upcoming future. And there are many languages that will die down. But to create a new language, that's a whole other deal. So I see that there are going to be less and less languages. Um, and do you think there will be some point when humanity is no longer Earth-centric, that we are so spread out and there's so many humans living off of Earth that Earth is just one of many places uh, that people might go? Or do you think Earth will always be special to us? Uh, uh, you know, since being uh, carbon-based, uh, uh, it's carbon-based uh, whole, and uh, being the start, I think all will always hold a dearly place in our uh, minds, our conscience. And but still, I don't think Earth will be, uh, you know, humanity-centric. But uh, we'll be so dispersed that, uh, yeah, Earth will just be a small fragment of where humanity, humanity settles. You know. That's a, a pretty amazing time, I think. Um, so if it was uh, safe and affordable, would you go to space? Absolutely. <laughs> I'd go to space right now. <laughs> um, how far would you go? Just to orbit, to the moon? Would you consider immigrating to Mars? Yes, <laughs> I would. I would go wherever they take me eventually, I'm basically. Well, that's uh, pretty neat. Well, those are basically the questions I had. Uh, what are some of your questions? And Yeah, so most of them I've asked already, uh, but uh, okay. So uh, yeah, you said there are, you're a third along the way, right? There are uh, 1,200 or 1,400 is uh, uh, interviews you're gonna take. So, I mean, what experiences based on now, what experiences do you think you will get after you complete all of them? You know, after these four years or five years of interviewing everybody. 
That is a really good question. Um, I think one thing is I, I will get a lot more comfortable talking to people. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. I mean, you're, you're already so much comfortable. Uh, I will learn that uh, I can commit to something and actually do it. Uh, there's so many projects I've started, but not finished. So now I, oh. I'm like uh, stuck and I have to finish this. Um, I hope to, um, I mean, I think it's going to be really fun to look back at these videos uh, 10, 20 years from now. And, um, you know, hopefully by that time, SpaceX has her starship flying, you know, hundreds of times a day. You know, people go to the moon like they go to Mount Everest or some, you know, kind of like uh, sailing around the world or something. Not something that everybody does, but you you feel like it's possible if you really wanted to, you know. Um, and I think that's going to be really neat. Um, I've, I've learned so many new things on this. Like, we have a monument in Washington, D.C., our, our capital here, called the Washington Monument. And I think it was built in, like, the 1700s. The one with the Abraham Lincoln statue? Well, no, it's just a big, tall, um, it's just a big, oh, tall oh, pillar. Yeah, 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 I, I know that. But on top of that, exactly. I, I, just to give you an idea on how things change, on top okay. of that, they put a big block of a precious metal. And do you know what that metal was? I have no idea. <laughs> Would you believe aluminum? At one time, aluminum was a precious metal. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've actually heard that one. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know if I saw it in a video or read it in a book, but yeah, the, I guess it was it were the Egyptians, if I'm not, or they valued aluminum more than gold, I heard, or so. Was it that one? Um, but I, I haven't done any research and I, I haven't read much. So, that, I mean, that could be true. I just don't know. That is true, actually. I've read, I don't know where, uh, but I have read that too, yeah. But you know, due to our, our mining and recycling, we've been able to get so much aluminum that now we use it to hold uh, sodas and, and cans and we, we use it to wrap sandwiches. And yeah. you know, we don't think anything of aluminum. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, traveling to moon could be like that. Yeah and get the perspective. So uh, the next question I would have is, uh, you know, uh, were you always fascinated with moon or did this mission, the Artemis mission, actually, you know, allure you to do these kinds of interview? Yeah, I, since a young age, I was always interested in space and space exploration. Um, you know, I, I my uh, dad took me to the uh, Johnson Space Center here whenever I was young and, you know, I would go and look at all the exhibits and I, you know, I, I wanted to see a, a rocket launch, which I haven't seen a rocket launch in person yet. It's I, either weather or other things keep uh, keeping that from happening. So, um, but I was also interested in computers too. And whenever I was graduating from high school, uh, going into college, the internet was really taking off. And, um, you know, then I got a job in, in computers and then that job led to another job led to another job. And so my entire career has been around computers, but I've always had an interest in, in space and it wasn't really until SpaceX started doing their developments that, um, you know, the, the excitement really got rekindled. That's amazing. And uh, are you associated or, or uh, collaborate with NASA? Uh, from time to time or? No, no, not at all. Um, so um, I haven't done any collaborations with NASA. I mean, at some point, like, uh, you know, how you like have these visions and dreams sometimes you're like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if that could happen? So one of those uh, kind of far out visions is, uh, you know, maybe having one of those astronauts that go on the moon, I'd take these videos on like a little um, micro SD card and, and put it on the moon as sort of like a, a, a memorial or something. So I, I thought that would be kind of cool. But um, I, I mean, I, 
there's uh, Space Center Houston, which is the visitor center next to the Johnson Space Center here in Houston. I volunteer there about once a month, uh, but that's not really a, a collaboration, but it's sort of uh, a little loose connection, if you will. Yeah, I mean, even volunteering, you know, you get to meet with such enthusiasts, space enthusiasts, fellow space enthusiasts, and I guess that is a pretty big deal in itself. Yeah, and thousands of people go to the uh, Space Center in Houston each day. And it's really uh, quite amazing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you're, you're right now in Houston as well? I am. Yeah, I live on the north side of Houston. And um, the Johnson Space Center and, uh, you know, the Space Center in Houston, they're, they're very much uh, on the south side of Houston. So really... You know, takes about an I, I hour to get ask, there. Oh, I gotta ask a question with the Houston residents itself, since you are one. Uh, how how common is the phrase Houston? We have a problem in, in there. <laughs> um, it it comes up uh, regularly. I I wouldn't say it's like an everyday thing, but um, um, you know, I I hear it, and you know, it could be just my house, right? And the people I work with, they all know I'm. <laughs> I'm into space, so maybe uh, that affects their language. Uh, so, you know, and most most of them do they know that this came from this phrase came from space, or do they use it, it as it is? I mean, not knowing the source. Well, I, unfortunately, whenever there's a problem, I usually the problem is more the focus uh, than the uh, um, than than the phrase itself. So. Uh, and then you know time passes and you don't know so i don't i don't know maybe <laughs> oh <laughs> okay i always wanted to ask that you know and i got my answer so thanks for that and uh i don't know i'm running out of questions right now <laughs> um, so you know you have interviewed uh, out of those 600 including me 601 interviews uh, have you met a like professional person who has uh, got into space and something like that? I have. I, I've uh, also interviewed the daughter of one of the moonwalkers, uh, one of the people that have walked on the moon. I've interviewed uh, his daughter, so that was kind of neat. Um, oh wow! I've interviewed uh, like there's this guy Frank White. He talks about the overview effect. Uh, and so I, I've interviewed him. I interviewed the CEO of a company um, that um, that makes life support systems for uh, you know uh, uh, rockets and and things to keep the astronauts alive. Uh, so that was neat. Um, and a lot of engineers, uh, a lot of rockets. I've interviewed a lot of people from Blue Origin actually. Uh, so that was. That was really cool. Yeah, and uh, you know, oh, uh, okay, name one interview where uh, you know they had no clue about the moon mission or space mission, anything. Well, you know? my original plan was to go up to people at coffee shops and on the streets and at the <laughs> airports. So uh, I would say uh, eighty percent of those interviews, they they had no clue. Um, uh, so that that would be a, a long list of interviews you used to do that pre-covid uh, i mean go to people with people in real life and ask them about it yeah exactly in fact that was one of my roles at the beginning was that uh, all the interviews had to be in person but then the covid lockdowns happened and and i had to um you know reconsider thank god it happened you know because i gotta have this interview with you i mean i know i would have only been able to interview people <laughs> where i've been which um, before COVID was happening, I did travel to Minneapolis, which is, you know, on the north side of the United States. And I traveled to the UK um, and to uh, uh, Scotland. And I interviewed people in person all the way uh, there. And then I came back and the COVID lockdown started happening. And then I uh, had did, it. Did you have a full plan of the countries you're going to travel uh, if, you, if the COVID didn't happen? I uh, know. No, I didn't. I didn't have a plan. Uh, but uh, I think that might be nice, uh, you know, maybe travel around and talk to people in person. Um, 
you know, it's, it's really difficult. I haven't quite figured out how to approach people and tell them about my project, you know, in, in a way that doesn't sound like I'm about to sell them something or, you know, <laughs> that I'm trying to scam them or, or something. You know? Yeah, that's a big problem, you know, because everybody does, people don't want to chat with people who want to like take surveys or take interviews. They always think that someone is kind of trying to sell them or trying to scam them in a way. Exactly. I mean, I think if people knew about my project before I talked to them, then they'd be like, oh, that's cool. You know, they would think it was neat. But, uh, you know, so, yeah. so that's, that's there. Um, I, yeah. And I mean, it's got to be midnight. Uh, it's got to be open morning by now, right? Or midnight? I, well, uh, morning. Uh, it's like 7.50 in the morning. Oh, do you wake up? Uh, you wake up way early at what, six, five? Yeah. So I try to schedule these before work. Um, you know, um, so, but I, I usually only work Monday through Friday. Today's uh, Sunday here. Um, and uh, I just found it's easier to keep the same time every day. That way I don't get confused. You know, otherwise I might be like, uh, you know, I might miss one. That would be bad. I haven't missed yes. one yet. A lot of other wow. people miss them, but I, I haven't missed one. <laughs> there are other people also doing this sort of stuff. Oh no, I, I I sometimes people schedule, but then they don't show up or uh, oh. you know that type of thing. So, oh, oh, oh. what? How many people's like uh, in a month? Uh, one or two, or are there many people who just skip or forget their interviews? Yeah, um, I would say about two a week. Oh, that is, I mean, that's quite, when you compound it to these years and years of interviews, that gets quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's sometimes uh, disheartening, uh, you know, a little, um, uh, you know, <laughs> saddening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, mean <laughs> you, I thought uh, you might have felt sad, you know, if I had not been there or you might I've already felt sad, you know, because my connection was lost and, you know, my thinking, I lost another one. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of a different story, though. I mean, it's like a big mystery. Um, but, you know, it seemed obvious that something happened to the connection, like your image froze and, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, you stopped talking and the connection dropped. So it, it seemed like, so the real mystery was, um, you know, when would the connection come back? So that that's more of a, a mysterious thing than a sad thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, my English isn't pretty good itself. And are there people like me or, you know, even uh, who are less fluent in English uh, that you have a hard time to communicate with? Uh, absolutely. In fact, there's one person from Russia that I interviewed. He didn't know any English. And oh, wow. we, we try to use Google Translate. And that interview was extremely difficult for both of us. Um, one challenge with Google Translate, I don't know if you've used it, uh, but they have an application on the phone and you can talk and then translate uh, and speak your, the other language and then listen and translate them. But the thing is, if you do any pause, like if you just you know, take a breath or give a pause, it thinks you're done talking. So it starts translating. You know, so you'll be like saying something like, you know, I think, and then to start translating that and you never get to hear what the, <laughs> they think after that, so. Yeah, it can be extremely difficult, you know. I've had, um, so my shortest interview, I think it was like 20, 30 seconds. My longest, wow. longest one was like three and a half hours. Um, wow, three and a half hours. In-person interviews are usually like five, 10 minutes. Um, sometimes it's longer, depends on who you're talking to, but the online interviews are like 30 minutes to, to 45 minutes or like the average. So. Oh, I thought, you know, since you were, you had 5.45 to 6.45 in my time, uh, I thought the interview would be over by 6.45, but, you know, or 6.15, but it's already 6.38 and, uh, you know, it's nice to talk to people, you know, fluently and freely. Uh, till all their questions are answered or all your questions are answered. 
Yeah, no, it's really, time. really difficult whenever people are, are busy. Um, and uh, you want to try to stick to a schedule so that they, you know, you don't disrupt their, their plans or your own plans. But the same token, uh, you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to cut things short if, if there, there are no schedule pressures. So it's, it's a challenge, you know, it, I remember like meeting for the first time, uh, you know, what it's hard to, hard to negotiate sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, these recordings, do you post them online and uh, uh, have a collection of them or? I do. Uh, all 600 that I've done so far are on countdowntothemoon.org. Um, okay. Not and that. I need to create a better uh, way to find interviews. You know, maybe people want to find interviews that fit in a, a particular category, like, um, you should be able to find uh, where are all the interviews with people from Nepal, you know, and then, boom, yeah. this one comes up. And, uh, but it's not quite there yet. That might be a, a project that I do after 2024. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, with such, such amount of videos, that is quite a, a long day data, you know, a huge amount of data to go through all of them and separate each one by one by category. And I think, uh, you know, YouTube automatically transcribes the, the videos, like uh, creates a text version of everything. And um, oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's possible to download that transcription. So I was almost thinking about creating a database, put all the transcriptions in there, and then, you know, looking for particular keywords, and then you would be able to find uh, like videos and it'd take you to that point in the video where you have the, that phrase or that keyword there. Absolutely. I mean, that would be, yeah, yeah, that would be great. But, you know, you gotta, uh, yeah, yeah. Did you upload, do you upload in YouTube as well? I do. Yeah. In fact, that's where I store all of them. So it's all in my uh, Gadget Nate account. So. Oh, great. And great, great. I, I started also this, um, I think it's going to be a weekly or every two weeks or maybe every three week program uh, called Nate and Nikita Countdown to the Moon. And it's meant to be kind of uh, uh, funny and, um, uh, you know, provide just a little bit of information. And I, I try to highlight um, videos, you know, interviews occasionally in there too. Uh, so that's that's another another thing. Okay, I will check that. Uh, it's in your YouTube channel, right? Yeah, I can send you a link directly to it. So. Please, please do. Uh, and uh, mm. and you know, with this uh, uh, commercial, uh, you know, space being commercialized now with uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, and some people are, you know, like the astronauts were critiquing it, you know, uh, critiquing Elon for commercializing space. But I perceive it as, you know, it should have been from the beginning, from a bit, uh, from a while now. And I think it's good that, that it's happening. What's your take on this, you know? Yeah, I think uh, if you want to make it widely available, it, you have to create an economy around it. Um, and, yeah. you know, with uh, lots of producers and consumers. Uh, otherwise, it'd just be a, a very small activity. Absolutely. Well, and oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Sure. I was just going to say, uh, do you have any plans to come to Houston? Uh, right now, I plan to finish my four years, but Houston, I would want to visit, actually. Uh, uh, Houston. Houston. Houston, where is it, right, actually, uh, exactly? Uh, so it's in the middle of the United States, uh, towards the bottom. Uh, so uh, just north of Mexico. Okay, okay. Uh, next to the, the water, the Gulf of Mexico. So. You know, there are, 
there's there are many states I know, but Houston, I actually don't know the geographical location of it. But yeah, I plan to visit US, you know, after my graduation, if uh, I get some, you know, scholarships or such uh, a proper university to study in. And if I'm there, sure, I'll visit the uh, Space Center. That would be neat. Yeah. And, and uh, as someone who has who, is, who comes to, constantly goes there or visits visits there, you know, is there any constraint to visit there? Uh, I mean, right now we have the the COVID uh, issues. Other than the COVID yeah. issues, there's no constraints. Oh, that's good to know. You know, because uh, it should be open to all uh, people. You know, excited in space, enthusiasts should be able to visit and visualize what they see. Yeah, they've uh, taken the mission control center uh, that they were using during the Apollo program and they've restored it. And you get to go there and they kind of replay the events of the actual first moon landing, the first time that they walked on the moon and then whenever they came back and, and you feel like it's going on right there in front of you. And it's really interesting to see the level of the technology that they had at that point. Yeah, that is amazing to think about, too. And you know, lastly, uh, what are some of the most an interesting answers you have gotten, you know, in these interviews? Uh, well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I remember my second interview, I was like, uh, what do you think we'll find on the moon? And it's like, well, maybe aliens. So I thought that was kind <laughs> of... Uh, I'm curious. Uh, you know, I mean, on one hand, it seems improbable uh, because we photographed the moon from lots of different directions. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we shouldn't roll out what we're going to see. Um, uh, we should try to see the universe without filters, you know, with, with, with naked eyes, uh, with the, the eyes of children who are just discovering the world. Not, not the eyes of adults who know exactly what they expect to see and, and have a concept of foolish things and, and non-foolish things. <laughs> mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our, our perspective of, uh, of aliens could be completely different from what you think right now, you know? And uh, out of infinite possibilities, anything could be. So always on the look for new things. Uh, I've also interviewed some young people uh, one of which was uh, my five-year-old nephew. Uh, <laughs> in person, <laughs> right? Or in, in person, Zoom? yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. person. Um, and he was really enthusiastic. He's like, am I going to the moon in 2024? <laughs> Can I go to the moon? I want to go to the moon, you know? So it's like really cute. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the interviews you did pre-COVID, uh, did you record these two or are they not available? Uh, yes. Uh, they're all all recorded. I I uh, use my iPhone and uh, you know recorded them. And in fact, um, whenever I started doing them online, I went through this little phase of not wanting to actually do them online, even though I was doing them online. I was doing this goofy thing of recording the screen with my iPhone, so it's still. But anyway, that that phase only lasted a few weeks, so we're we're oh. safe. <laughs> Okay, not miss videos with that quality then. But every single every single interview is uh, online. Yep, uh, all six hundred and very shortly six hundred and one of them. <laughs> cool, cool. And you know, since you started this interview, I mean, lots of people must have come in your contacts, right, asking you about the moon mission and about everything about space, moon mission, Artemis. Yeah, uh, some of them, um, you know, but if you talk to somebody that's waiting for their, their coffee at the coffee shop, uh, usually whenever uh, they get their coffee, they're ready to go, so. <laughs> yeah. So in fact, uh, I remember uh, interviewing somebody waiting for the shop to open and about two or three minutes into the interview, the shop opens. And so we're like interviewing as he's walking into the shop so he can get his place in line. It's kind of funny, but yeah. Lots of experiences, I see. Definitely, 
yeah, this, this is a, a good project to uh, make sure that you're getting out there and interacting with one human in a, a non-trivial way, at least once a day. Yeah, you know, I thought this interview would be like with more people, you know, more people and I would be interviewed. So that was kind of pressurizing at the first, but seeing you alone and getting to have a good chat was really great experience for me as well, Nathan. But same here, same here. And it's, it's always good to um, hear from people directly instead of, yeah, you know, uh, just hearing things on the, the news and imagining what people are like. I think if people just talk to each other more, they'd find out that, uh, um, you know, the possibilities are, are much better than, than what we're led to believe. Absolutely, you know, and with, yeah. With this now going all virtual nowadays, people are communicating more, less and less, you know, and uh, I guess communication self should be the key to explore each other's and ourselves more. I, I, it's been uh, really good to talk to you. And uh, I think I, I better let you go. Um, but uh, I sure. hope you have a, a good rest of your day. Thank you. And you too. I mean, good morning and have a great day, Nathan. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.